Thank you so much for coming to the second in the series, Next Ottawa, a speaker series by Connecting Environmental Professionals of Ottawa, which you all know since you're all here. Thanks so much for coming. Um, first, a little bit about CEP before we dive into the content of tonight. Uh, this event is called Climate Finance, Unlocking Capital Markets to Finance the Low Carbon Transition. Our speaker is Sean McCarthy. Uh, CEP Ottawa is a chapter of Connecting Environmental Professionals Canada, and so it's a national organization with chapters in Vancouver, Calgary, and Toronto, uh, as well as Ottawa. Our mission is to facilitate constructive dialogue and inspire action on key environmental and sustainability issues. Uh, basically, we believe there's power in bringing people together to talk about these things, to share ideas, to share solutions, and since you're all here, I'm sure you believe the same thing. So quickly, we have two new additions to our team since last month's event. We have Michelle Kong, who has joined the team as the VP of Business Development. She's outside. And we have Kartik here as well, who's joined as VP of Marketing. So feel free to introduce yourself to them. They're the two standing at the back of the room there. Um, and just so you know, we are actually looking for two more positions. If you're interested in being part of CEP, please approach me. We're looking for a VP of Finance and a VP of Events to help organizing wonderful experiences like this. Um, quick, sorry we don't have name tags. Last event we did, this event we weren't able to coordinate it. Next event, I promise we'll have name tags so you can mm -hmm. you know, see it's the other person's name when you're talking to them. Quick event plan for tonight. We're going to start off with Sean's talk, then we're going to move into a bit of a fireside chat section of the event where we do one-on-one -on -one interview in front of the audience, and then we'll open up to audience questions. Um, before we dive into the event, all events are posted on YouTube, so after this, go to the CEP YouTube channel, and you can share it with your friends, or you can follow up and rewatch and find any of the things that you may have missed. Um, we also have three events that we've now planned for our next event. So on March 31st, you can already get your tickets. Chris Henderson, uh, the president of the Delphi Group and the CEO of Lumos Energy, is coming in to speak about catalyzing change, catalyzing sustainability, the leadership challenge of realizing impact at scale. He's an incredible speaker. I really encourage you to come get a ticket to that one. And then after that, we're having Eric Pervin from Ecology Ottawa come in to talk about their approach, their history, and how they you know, uh, facilitate and coordinate sustainability initiatives within the city. And then in June, we're having Adam Auer, who's the VP of Sustainability of the Cement Association of Canada, coming in to talk about the sustainability challenges of cement and concrete and how they're finding solutions to those. Um, and that's about it. Thank you so much. So let's get right to the event, since I know we're starting a little bit late. Just gave people a bit of time to show up, since it is a bit of a drizzly day. So our speaker is Sean McCarthy. Sean McCarthy is a freelance writer and senior counsel for Sussex Strategy Group, focusing on its energy and environment practice. But until September 2009, Sean was a national business correspondent with The Globe and Mail, covering the global energy beat from the paper's parliamentary bureau in Ottawa. In that role, he covered a wide range of energy issues, including our pipeline battles, the rapidly changing electricity sector, and the risks and opportunities posed by climate change and the transition to a low carbon future. So needless to say, he's very well educated on this and has been following these issues for quite a long time. Uh, Sean has taught journalism courses at Carleton and serves as volunteer president for the Canadian Committee for World Press Freedom, uh, an Ottawa-based advocacy group. So, and tonight, Sean will be talking about, as we said, climate finance. Um, banks, pension funds, and other asset managers are increasingly promoting their commitment to a low carbon future while facing warming, warnings about climate related risks to traditional business models and operations. However, there's no clear shared understanding of the risks and opportunities. Um, and this can reinforce the inertia that favors the fossil fuel sector. Mr. McCarthy will speak on Canada's response to these international developments, including the recommendations of the Federal Expert Panel on Sustainable Finance and the Liberal government's response to it. It should be really interesting, and I encourage you all to pay attention, think of your questions, note them down, because we will be following up with the question period after this. And after the event, we'll be going downstairs. We have a section reserved. You can buy a cocktail and continue to talk to people. So without further ado, please welcome Sean McCarthy to the stage. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming out, and um, thanks, Lucas, for in, for inviting me. We met at a uh, at a session um, a few months back that were on on housing, and uh, I was talking about uh, I think it was the election was on, I think, yeah, and we were talking about uh, about the platform. 
So just a, a, a quick uh, little correction. Uh, I, I retired in 2019, not 2009. So <laughs> um, um, I, I think it's the title's a bit of a mouthful. Unlocking capital markets to find. I mean, that's um, what I what I really wanted to do was give you an overview of what climate finance looks like, and then, as Lucas said, you know, really talk a little bit about. Um, the big push, and, and it is it is potentially momentous uh, in in the capital markets uh, for um, financing both both moving capital out of the fossil fuel sector and moving capital uh, just as importantly into the uh, the clean energy sector and and all of the uh, various technologies. Um, energy efficiency I include in the clean energy sector clearly uh, um, using using our energy more efficiently and productively is uh, is really really important um, so just a just a word about how I how I got here uh, because I think it's I think it's an interesting um, progression and I think it, it's illustrative a little bit of how over the last 13 years, 14 years, uh, things developed. So I was long career uh, in journalism. I, I landed at the Globe uh, in 1997, did a stint as the bureau chief. I was in New York City for a couple of years. Um, and when I came back in 2006, they said, why don't you take on what we'll call a global energy beat? Um, sounded good to me. I, I went to school in Alberta and had some experience in that in that world and, and was very interested. So um, what were the stories I was going to be covering? Well, peak oil, because 14 years ago, believe it or not, everybody thought that we were going to run out of oil fairly quickly, or at least shift to the very heaviest kind of oil sands crude that um, um, the Canada um, produces, and, and concerns about peak oil and rising prices. Um, importing natural gas, that was going to be a big trend that I was going to cover because North America was running out of natural gas. Now, of course, you know we're building pipelines, or not, to uh, export natural gas out of Canada and, and the Americans uh, are, are doing likewise. Um, Chinese takeover of the oil sands, well, there was uh, one very big deal that uh, um, didn't go so well and, and uh, was, was not approved. And, I think uh, CNOC, the Chinese company that wanted to take over, um, um, sorry, no, that was what, um, Nexon Energy um, was very happy that uh, the government said no because it would have been a disaster for them. They did move in and, and take on some other uh, assets. So just an illustration of how much the world has, has changed in just that 15 years. And climate change I was going to cover. And climate change was kind of sort of third or fourth down the list. And it was recognized to be an important subject. But editors at the Globe and Mail and certainly at the Report on Business were, um, it, was, it was not top of mind, that's for sure. A um, couple of things changed in addition to all the, all the market changes. Um, um, Barack Obama got elected, for one thing. And, and so Barack as much as he had difficulty moving the climate file through Congress, there was a lot of push there, and it did move up the agenda. And you know, the Copenhagen um, summit of the UN, you know, they had the annual UN summits um, happened, and was very disappointing. But it it at least put climate change, you know, at, at the top of the news cycle in terms of the mainstream media that that I worked in. Um, and, and in the business section, you know, the, the, uh, I was actually very fortunate in that the, the business editors at the Globe and Mail allowed me to write as much about climate change as I did over the years because they recognized that this was not just an environmental issue or a scientific issue or a societal issue. It was a huge economic issue and, um, you know, clearly for starting with the oil and gas sector in Western Canada um, and, and then broadening it out. So I really came at it 
um, as, a, as a business reporter, first covering the oil and gas sector and what climate change and, and the regulations and the fights and the opposition to pipelines was all meaning for the oil and gas sector, the Globe and Mail, to our shame, did not have an environment reporter to my benefit because then I got to to broaden the broaden my horizons and cover some of the cops and so on. So it went from oil and gas to energy and climate change to climate finance. And in the last couple of years in particular, I've, I've really played a lot of, paid a lot of attention to climate finance uh, because I, I, I think it is one of those elements um, of this whole puzzle that is starting to fall into place. We're not there yet, but, but when, if and when it does, it will be hugely important. Um, um, just some, just by way of um, scale, I guess. So the top, the market cap. So when when an oil company trades on the on the Toronto Stock Exchange or the New York Stock Exchange, the total value of those shares it's it's, it's called its market capitalization, right? Um, for the top ten oil and gas producers in the world that are publicly traded, market capitalization is $1.5 trillion US. $1.5 trillion US. That's the money, that doesn't include all the debt they have, which is at least as much probably. Um, market cap for the top five Canadian oil companies is $153 billion Canadian. Um, by way of comparison, the Canadian government revenues for the year are about $160 billion. So, just the top five Canadian oil companies, the, the value in the market, and this was, I think, in July, so it's probably gone down a fair bit, but, but roughly comparable to what the federal government raises every year in revenue. That's a lot of money, and that's a lot of money that's at stake. So, um, and that market cap, the, those, those shares are owned by individuals, you know, I have an RRSP, I don't have a lot of oil and gas in there, but, uh, you know, a lot of people do. Um, by the pension funds, the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board, which invests all your money, uh, mm -hmm. assuming you're paying into Canada Pension Plan, um, has a lot of oil and gas, and, and along with all the other assets that they have in their, in their portfolio. So the, the pension funds, the mutual funds that people buy, um, and then individuals buying stocks, right? So, so it, it goes deep and it goes broad in terms of what's at stake financially. Um, so when I, when I first started, I would say probably, well, it goes back really to, to when I started covering, but it but, but picked up steam um, over the years that you started hearing about a divestment movement, right? And um, on, on university campuses and in the, in the um, not-for-profit sector and so on, there was a big push for um, pension funds and, and uh, other shareholders to stop buying oil and gas or coal stocks, fossil fuel stocks. Um, and stop investing in them. Period. Um, and it was it was um, for a long time, um, I would say, more of a social political statement um, than it was um, a, a big financial issue for the companies. You know, the the Ursuline Sisters of Canada, um, who have announced that they would a few years ago that they would not buy fossil fuel stocks. No chief financial officer at an oil company was going to lose sleep over the Ursuline sisters, um, but they did sometimes come to to shareholder meetings and and uh, and make political statements. And so I, I don't want to demean it. It was important politically, um, but it, it financially not so much. Um, but now we have now we have. BlackRock in asset manager, the largest asset manager. So, so these companies will, the Canadian Pension Plan Investment 
fund will manage a lot of its money, but it will then hire what are called asset managers to manage assets and buy and sell their their uh, shares and, and debt and so on. BlackRock is the largest asset manager um, in, in the world um, and they announced just in January that they would no longer buy or um, trade in coal-based um, um, investments and were skeptical about um, oil and particularly everybody who is making these announcements now and I covered a number of them over the years um, in, in the last couple years in particular as, as the momentum gathered um, they distinguish between um, oil and oil sands and I would say that you know for, for two reasons one is the reality is that oil sands and Extracting oil from oil sands is extremely carbon intensive. In Canada, in Venezuela, there are deposits in the U.S. There, there's oil is kind of on a gradient. You go from really light to really, really heavy, like the tar sands. And you know the really heavy part was is far more carbon intensive. So, you know, to some degree, they were reacting to the reality of it. They were also reacting to a very successful campaign by environmental groups in North America and around the world to uh, um, bring attention to the fact that not all oil is the same and, and some oil is, uh, is uh, more problematic with huge reserves of it in the world um, that um, people were treating it more like coal and less like light oil. Uh, for these for these issues, so you know this 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 divestment movement has really um, blossomed from kind of a political statement that was on the margin to you know the largest um, pension funds California pension funds have said they were going to stop buying um, coal and would be very reluctant to buy oil, buy oil sand stocks. Um, Norway's pension fund did the same thing, um, and and it's not what has changed, and and this is where I'm 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 going to take we'll go deeper on what has changed is that these pension funds aren't doing it for the most part because they're great corporate citizens and care deeply more deeply than they used to about the earth. I mean to some degree. Maybe they, you know, the the increased evidence that climate change is real and here now, and you know, if you're paying any attention at all, you should be worried about where we're headed. Um, you know, I hope that that has some resonance in the in the boardrooms, but what I know has resonance is the fact that they don't like risk, or or they want they want to put a price on risk. So risk is a big word here. Um, and risk and opportunity is always at play in financial markets, right? So, you know, if, if, if I'm going to lend you money, I'm going to look at you and, and I'm going to assess your business plan and I'm going to try and figure out how much risk are you taking on, how, how solid is your plan, you know, what, what's your market like, and, and so on. And if it's a low risk investment, I will charge you X. And if it's a high risk investment, I'll charge you two times X or three times X. So for, for, the, for the corporations, when they go out to try and raise money, the cost of capital matters. And so when you see things happening in the oil sands, like um, tech walking away from its, its late, latest project, one of the factors, and it's only one of the factors, but one of the factors is that it's just becoming more difficult and more expensive for them to raise money to build something like that. Mm -hmm. So cost of capital matters, and if you're an investor, you have, especially the long-term investors, you're, you know, we, we hear a lot in the market about short-term investment and, 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 the, and the capital, capitalists don't 
can't think beyond you know the next quarter and so on. And that's true for the stockbrokers and the portfolio managers who are managing my RRSPs and, and so on. But the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board has assets. That they have to pay you, you know, somebody who's 30 years old, they have to figure out they're going to be paying you 30 years from now. And they need to make sure that their assets and their liabilities align in some way. And so the long-term um, lenders, uh, the, those that have long-term assets, um, are more concerned about those long-term risks and are really starting to uh, pay more attention. Um, you know, the, the phrase sustainable finance um, um, is really a, is, is a big is a is a big phrase, and it's it's not you know we could do we could do a, a master seminar and spend a, a full year um, um, going through this, and it would be I, well, maybe it would bore you, it would not bore me, um, <laughs> but um, that's that's me. Um, but it, it there's plenty of of element. There are plenty of elements to this, and, and um, you know it, it ranges from. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Aaron, who I know here from the Auto Auto Renewable Energy Cooperative, um, uh, that raises money locally and takes that money in a cooperative sense. It's not a it's not a for profit organization, uh, and invests it in renewable assets, renewable energy assets. You know, there's a sustainable, sustainable finance element to that. Um, there are green bonds out there where um, people can borrow money having shown that they are pursuing sustainability um, investments and borrow money somewhat cheaper and certainly they use it to burnish their reputation that they're out there in the market. You know, there is principled investment. There are lots of stocks and mutual funds, not stocks, but mutual funds and, and other kinds of funds where you can, if you're investing in your RSP, you can be sure that this fund is not investing in oil and gas and you can put your money in there. So it really does cover the whole gamut. But I, I think um, given the time we have, what where I wanted to focus was more on the capital markets because it is it, again. I think it has the potential to be to be really uh, a, a powerful thing, and I, I and I think it's um, something that Canada is still a bit of a laggard on, um, and and more on that in a second. So in 2015, the G20, the group of 20 industrialized countries, they all come together for their summits, um, asked um, an international organization that that the sustain it's called the um, stability board international stability board that's not right but um, um, it's it's like a, it's the group of, of uh, central banks and and the regulators who look after the banks from all around the world and they come together and they're the stabilization hmm. board and and their their job is to try to make sure that the whole financial system doesn't collapse. Um, and so um, the G20 asked the st Stabilization Board to look into issues of climate risk and what are the risks that climate change might actually bring the whole friggin' economy down. Um, Mark Carney, who was the governor of the Bank of Canada um, for many years, then went off to England and became the governor of the Bank of England. Mark Carney uh, chaired that process and has been a huge um, proponent of making financial markets um, more um, transparent and building, you know, really bringing the climate change issues central into into the financial into the financial markets around the world. So he actually hired Michael Bloomberg, whom you will all know now as the uh, as running for the Democratic uh, leadership, former mayor of uh, New York and, and founder of Bloomberg Finance. And Bloomberg did a report that said what we really need is everybody to is to have a format where everybody can 
report on the risks that they face from climate change, and then report on the opportunities so that all investors can look at the risks and the opportunities and make their bets accordingly. Um, so three types of risks, physical risks. So if you're an insurance company, you have a lot of physical risk out there. I was just reading uh, um, a figure on uh, trillions of dollars of U.S. real estate that is on uh, on coastal areas that could be um, over the not long term uh, in the next decade or two um, underwater literally and, and imagine the losses that insurance firms will, will face from that. So liability risks they talk about, lots of uh, lawsuits starting to arise. Um, you know, we saw it with tobacco, now people are trying to sue the oil companies uh, for knowing that climate change was a problem and, and hiding it and doing nothing about it. And then what they call the transition risk, which is, you know, um, I'm an oil company and suddenly I have to, um, people are against my pipeline and the government's coming in with carbon taxes and, and a uh, limit on emissions from, from my sector, and that's um, transition risk. So um, Bloomberg brought out this report. The government brought in a, a, its own panel, which made a whole bunch of recommendations on what the government of Canada should do to make sure that investors can look at all the books. And, and that includes, by the way, all the companies. Bloomberg wants all the companies, and, and Carney, want all the companies to do an assessment as to what their business would look like if the world actually succeeded in meeting Paris targets. And that should be in the reporting that they do to the securities commissions. Mm -hmm. So you, you go and you look at it and you think, you know, doesn't mean we're gonna get there, right? It's, it's information, if I'm an investor, I might make a bet that the world's never gonna change, it's not gonna happen, I'm gonna go in and do it anyway, but it's, it's out there. Um, I, I'm mindful of time. Um, one thing I, I, I do wanna, really stress though, and that is that, you know, all this unlocking financial markets, it doesn't happen voluntarily, and it doesn't happen by magic, you know, I mean, the, there, the, some of these risks, like I said, the, the physical risk and the liability risks are, are more, uh, less dependent on government, but the transition risks, if, you know, if government doesn't adopt policies that will force the economy to make the changes, you know, carbon taxes, regulatory uh, changes, um, those are the two big mechanisms, right, at the hand of the government. Maybe some financing uh, um, to, and support for technology. But, but if government doesn't drive policy and drive it pretty aggressively, the risks are going to look a lot lower and the opportunities are going to look, uh, for, for the clean sector, are going to look a lot lower. So this financial thing is important, but it's only, it's really important if government actually acts to, to drive that perception of risk and that perception of opportunity so that the mon that's where the money goes, because otherwise, you know, people will be making their bets and, and um, again, if, if you're looking at the U.S. and you think Donald Trump is going to win an election, you're not too worried about investing in an oil company, right? not for the next four or five years. If you think uh, Bernie Sanders is going to win the election, you'd be a, a lot more worried about investing in an oil company because he's going to, to the degree that he can, with the support of Congress, drive policy that's going to make it harder and more expensive to produce oil. Um, I would say the same thing, um, and then Lucas and I will uh, pick it up, but I will say the same thing about technology. You know, we often hear that, you know, what we really need is technology, you know, and, and corporations will adopt technology, and that's what's going to save us. Sure, we need technology. Of course we need technology. Corporations are not going to pay to adopt new technology unless the incentives are out there for them to do it. And the incentives, not exclusively, but are largely driven by government and government policy. So, so government policy is at the center of all this. And I think uh, as we get into it, we'll talk about what what this government is doing. And we have a budget coming up pretty soon. I don't think they've announced the date. I'm told it's the 23rd, but uh, don't uh, 
don't go out and, you know, I don't have that on great authority. Um, so, you know, don't put it in the newspaper or anything. Um, but um, it's, it's going to be a big issue and something I'm going to be watching very closely as and, and writing about afterwards is what have they done with this with this issue with, with all these recommendations that came their way um, to uh, to move this forward so we'll uh, I'll end it there and but looking forward not just talking to Lucas but your questions and I'm happy to uh, okay. so that was a really interesting start. I, I think everybody has a ton of questions, so we'll keep this portion of it pretty quick. Um, but I just wanted to get into two kind of main topics. So like you said, the Liberals are putting out a budget sometime in the next little while. They've been talking a lot about this big 2050 net zero goal and some of the intermediary goals to get there. Do you think that they could realistically have a net zero plan? And, and what finance, climate finance elements might be a part of it? So I, I think that um, I was, I was uh, sort of in dialogue, I guess, on Twitter about this, and, and, and my view was that a 2020 plan, to be credible, you know, you, you have to have short-term plan, and you have to have, you know, you have to lay out a, a, a plan, a target, to, for a target to be credible, you have to lay out a, a, a plan. And, and then take really aggressive short-term action to, to start to get there. Somebody said, and I, and I think it's quite right, that, um, you know, I mentioned technology, and technology is moving fast. So to think that you should put in place in 2020 an exact roadmap as to how you're going to get to 2050, I, I think would be um, foolhardy. I mean, it's, you know, you, you, it, it's just changing way too fast. So some notion of how you get there, I think, is good and, and um, important. And more important is you're not going to get there um, if you spend the next 10 years doing not very much, or even the next five years doing not very much. And you're certainly not going to have much credibility if, if you don't. So you know, I, I think what they're talking about is having a plan sketched out and then five-year targets. And, and you have to hit those five-year targets, and, uh, and um, the UK has done it like that, and they've had some success with that. So, um, I mean, this is a tough country to govern, though. You, we, we know what's happening in Alberta. The oil sands are 25% of emissions now, and, and, you know, they're not keen on, certainly at the very most that they're looking at is, is holding them to some, as, you know, some level of growth, not reducing them over the next, um, certainly not the next 10 years and probably not the next 20. There is some technology there that uh, could be promising if, if they had all the incentives and the, and the, and the push and the regulations to, to put it in place, because otherwise they'll just pull as much oil out of the ground and sell it as fast as they can, and, you know, that's, Hope for the best, I think. But um, so I, I, you know, it's, I, it's, it's hard to see a net zero when you're when you're when you're building um, fossil infrastructure that's going to last beyond 50 years. But it's net, right? And so there are other things that you can do to to take some of that carbon out of the air or capture it, and all of these things. And I know, and and. And then I'll stop. Every question you ask me, I can talk forever. Um, so I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, carbon capture, I know, is a is a very uh, controversial um, um, idea. Um, I think um, if you read the IPCC reports, most of the pathways to get to um, to keep it at 1.5 degrees include. A lot of carbon capture, mm -hmm. um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out, and I, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't reject it out of hand. It also includes and an, a lot of nuclear. And again, this is not a, a technology that is favorably viewed by the environmentalist community, but um, you know, it's 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 tough to get to net zero, and some of these things that people don't like uh, may have to play a big role. 
Sure. And so now I'm going to quote from an article you recently published uh -oh. in, <laughs> <laughs> in Corporate Nights. You're saying, former conservative finance minister Joe Oliver, writing in his financial post, criticized the Macklin panel, saying its proposals will undermine a fundamental underpinning of the market economy with negative consequences for profitability, capital formation, and wealth creation. What truth do you think there is to this statement? And, and given what you've said, what kind of arguments can we make to the contrary? Right. So the Macklem report was this um, one that the government put together, the uh, expert panel on sustainable finance with all of its recommendations. And, and the thing that, um, um, you really want me to talk about fiduciary duty, eh? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <It is coming. laughs> the, the, the thing that Joe Oliver, whom I covered as minister here, and um, um, piece of work, um, the, the, thing that, the thing that he was so concerned about is this idea, in, in, typically in the financial markets, everybody is bound by fiduciary duty, which means that you do the best for your client as you can, um, and if you're an investor, you invest on a risk-adjusted basis, but still, you don't take in social concerns, you don't take in... Um, Really, it's, it's a financial decision that you make with some risk adjustment to it. And that's what they're responsible to do. And the big difference between the uh, Case to Depot and the Canadian uh, uh, Pension Plan Investment Board, Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board uh, has, is told to only um, basically invest for the benefit of its, its uh, constituents. Um, the case has a, has a more political and social mandate to it. Um, so they're worried and, and you know, I, it's it, doing these assessments on climate risk and opportunity and what the world might look like if the world actually achieves a two degree or 1.5 degree target, it's not a simple thing to do, right? And so you are introducing into the investment world a whole bunch of unknown factors that, that you know, and, and will make it more difficult to do. Oliver's view is that climate change, don't be worried, and it's not a, it's not a, uh, a an overwhelming threat anyway, so, you know, it's hard to see, you know, why he would, um, he would never accept that we would have to um, have pension plans that are concerned about this. I talked to, in that same article, I, I quoted Michael Sabia, who was leaving the, uh, the case, and the case has, um, do is doubling their clean energy investment from 2017 to the end of this year, and reducing by 30% the carbon intensity of their portfolio. So for mm -hmm. every dollar they put out into the market, you can calculate how, you know, what percent, how intensive your portfolio is. You know, the, Sort of carbon emissions per dollar. Carbon emissions per dollar. Thank yeah. you. Um, and and but his his view is that it's already part of your fiduciary duty as an certainly as a public pension investor to make sure that the people that you're investing on behalf of have a livable planet 20, 30, 40 years from now. So um, his view is that it's already baked in the fiduciary duty. But the Macklem report, it's. Um, argued that the federal government should make it explicit and really make it clear that your fiduciary duty, whether you're the Canada Pension Plan or the uh, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan or whomever, uh, includes um, climate change and making sure that, that you're investing in a way that uh, is consistent with holding the increase in temperatures to 2 degrees or hopefully 1.5. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah, and I think now we're going to move on to audience questions. So, in holding your question, we'll start with you, Rob. I have one that would need. Could you uh, identify uh, yourselves too? It'd be dovetail. interesting to know who you are. Uh, you need which? Oh, that would it, that would dovetail into that last yeah, for sure. there. But, um, Rob Nickel, I'm. Uh, I guess I, I worked for E Triple C just recently started, so just okay. finished a master's, and um, you know, long time uh, interest in in um, environmental. Like ESG stuff like the Global Reporting Initiative, right. uh, and um, personally, I've I've tried to divest uh, as well. I worked with 350.org on the divestment uh, campaign right. in Australia, where it was successful. Here in Canada, we're like 
behind on so many things, uh, I, I won't get too far into that, but I was uh, doing some research on fossil fuel subsidies and just in terms of like um, uh, uh, clean investments and, and it's about like getting skin into people and why, why the Green parties don't seem to find any success here in Canada and, and in some countries and there is an example of, of Germany where, where the average uh, investment in, in, uh, in renewables was like some, a very low amount, like 100,000 euros as opposed to here where it's more institutional, there's some collective stuff. Uh, one thing is that group pension plans here don't offer uh, ESG compliant, like responsible investment options. You can do it yourself, but the average person, uh, you know, it's, it's very challenging to do that. There's a lot of options now, ETFs yeah. and things like that, yeah. ESGs and low carbon investments, but when you're working with a with a company, you know, Great West Life or the other ones uh, that 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 have a monopoly over these group pension plans, they don't offer that. And so, uh, to get people to have skin in the game and vote more with you know with their their interests in mind, it would be good to to get some legislation maybe that would make it a mandatory thing. That and also to get the sustainability reporting, uh, you know, yeah. mandatory. Um, the TSX. Yeah. With those are, there there's two questions? suggestions. The one thing, the question really was, do you think that that's like politically feasible, I guess, um, to, to get, uh, to, to force, you know, the, the big um, asset managers to provide that option? You know, it's great that the Canada so Pension Plan or yeah. the T Ontario, you know, Teachers Plan or all these big ones can do it, but for the average person that has no option, they start with a uh, with, uh, company. Uh, and that's the one that they have, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, the, the maximum report did. Did they mention they, that? They have a, a number of areas where they're talking about making more um, um, sustainable investments available on the retail level. I don't know that they specifically mentioned the, the but it's a good point in terms of the, the pension funds, um, but uh, they, they definitely were talking about retail and and other um, areas, ETFs, you know, exchange treated funds that um, could leave out the oils. Problem with some of the sustainable investing, um, um, or maybe it's not a problem. It depends on your point of view. But a lot of the funds that um, that um, would say that they're sustainable, um, you know, the um, Carbon Carbon Disclosure Project uh, is, is an international fund. The CDP is an international fund that uh, that um, tries to rate companies, um, and a lot of it's based on transparency. And so, you know, some of the Canadian biggest Suncor does very well on these things. Um, Enbridge does very well on these things. Mm -hmm. A big pipeline company because they, in their sector, tend to be the more progressive companies in their sector, and so. You know, there's there, there's a lot of detail that you have to go through to really be sure. If you, if you don't want to invest in oil and gas, say, or fossil fuels generally, um, so, some of these uh, um, um, ESG funds may not really be what you're looking for. But it's still incrementally better than, yes. you know, yeah, that's yes. all I think. Absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to chime in there because um, the, the, I've worked with the uh, I've worked with Primerica in the past, and I know that they align with uh, a company called NEI Investments, and they have a large portfolio. I think they're exclusively, uh, uh, or mostly, well, predominantly, uh, deal with funds that are dealing with ESG components for sure. And there's you know ratings based on you know how it's, what's their performance uh, financially, but also what's their performance from an ESG perspective. And that's built into their fund facts for all their all their uh, individual uh, funds. So if there are options out there. Um, yes, for group, um, it's the way that they set it up. You can set it up as like a. Um, it's almost like a group fund, but each person can control which fund they put it in. Mm -hmm. So it's it's sort of like a hybrid between like a group pension plan and an individual plan. 
Um, but yeah, I'm not sure about like strict group plans. Yeah, yeah, just to have the option, you know, available. I, in Australia, I, I moved my pension assets into a socially responsible uh, uh, portfolio, and that was an option with like, and they all have like they they have this. You know, it was also the way similar similar pension system to ours. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah. I think what you're mentioning as well, though, is that the, there's also these types of funds often carry a higher risk. They're all like they call them like specialty funds. Yeah, but they, they also have had better funds. returns, and, and that's yeah. not hard. Mine's been, the market, I mean, though, if you were invested in the oil industry since 2014, you, you won't have been very happy. But that, you know, <laughs> some some of that is cyclical. It's, not, it's yeah. we don't know, right? Uh, how much of that is cyclical, and how much of that is long term secular, as they call yeah. it? You know, yeah. that mm. and and that that's to be determined, to be discovered. But uh, you know, it certainly I've seen people comparing, but. Uh, been a bad few years for the oil industry. Yeah. Yeah. A question back here? Yes, uh, Janice Adworth, I'm working for the city of Ottawa on their um, climate change plan and, and specifically the funding aspects of that, the, the financing aspects of it. And I brought this up to you before when you spoke, Sean, but I'm going to um, preface it a little differently, which is um, the modeling that the city is doing right now is that over the next three years, or predominantly over the next 10 years, that there is significant investments that need to be made in infrastructure community at large in order to meet the climate change objectives of the Paris Agreement, which has also been approved by the city of Ottawa. So 100% and zero by 2050, but mostly 96% by 2040 is what we need to get to in order to meet the current budget allocations from, from the Paris Agreement. And so um, what that ultimately results in is about a $45 billion price tag for the community at large, um, incrementally above and beyond what we already do to upgrade our predominantly our buildings and our transportation buying electric vehicles and making our houses net zero um, and our buildings net zero. And so um, so the, the question that I'm getting at here is the other modeling that we're doing is showing that if the savings from the initial investments are captured and reinvested, we can reduce that $45 billion by about two-thirds and bring it down to, call it 25, 20 billion or even 12 is kind of the ideal scenario if all of the savings are reinvested. Can you or anyone in the room imagine a way that that, that kind of coordination could be facilitated through a financial market um, where savings are then reinvested and that is not necessarily just done through like a Canada Infrastructure Bank or, you know, is there a way that financial markets could be coerced to encourage or enable or require that sort of reinvestment cycle um, to reduce the cost of society at large? So it's hard to, it, it's hard to monetize savings mm -hmm. in that way. Because unless unless yeah. you're asking some every of the savings, and some of it is generation, right? Some of it's easier to monetize energy sales through right. renewable energy sales or biogas sales, or, right. and right. some of it is savings. But if yeah, so if if I'm not if I mean if I I mean typically the model is um, and and there are a lot of um, some of you in the room might be in this business, but there are a lot of um, um, demand management companies that will come in and saying, we'll do your building, um, we will finance it, and you will still pay for five years what you were paying now, or usually uh, they get it, because there has to be an incentive for the, for the customer too. So basically you split the savings, right? And the, and the, uh, and the, the, fine, the management company finances it, and, and that's doable. Um, it's, it's, but, um, I'm not sure how, how what you're talking about. I guess in terms of maybe we can talk afterwards and um, you can explain it to me. But um, it just seems, from a society point of view, how how you how you take that energy savings and and a make sure that it's not because with energy efficiency and energy savings there can be a, a bad loop here where you know I. You don't always capture all the savings from energy efficiency, right? People do more, and you know you're you're more efficient, but you're doing more, um, and and that's that's one of the uh, one of the traps around energy efficiency. But even at a societal level, to try and find, I think these are the things that you know in in brilliant young people at uh, at the at. Uh, know, doing their MBAs and, and so on are going to be working on because, you know, certainly the, the people coming into 
the business world and, and the career, career world now, sustainability issues are going to be with you forever. So um, people are going to have to figure it out and, and so people smarter than me will no doubt do that. <laughs> um, just respond to that and respond to you as well, just to, from the building spot point of view. So um, the, my company, we deal exactly with that. So how to, how to create and monetize energy efficient buildings. So basically the problem is right now is, uh, you know, Developers will buy a piece of land, build the building as cheaply as they can, and then offload it to sell it. And because it's, it's fast money in and fast money out, they have no long-term interest whatsoever. So they, they do exactly what you see in this building. It's like concrete, floor to glass, floor to ceiling windows, quick and simple. And then you know somebody rents it out, and whoever's renting it out as that tenant, they, through a triple net lease, they have, have to pay the energy, so they don't care. So there's a huge disconnect. And then when you have a, a hot economy, and then people have to rent. Uh, everybody here downtown, buildings along Bank Street, they just need a place to, to, to rent out. And of course, they, have to, and they don't want to be energy, they can't be energy efficient, because they don't own the building. So if you're you know, as simple as a Starbucks or a small shop owner, you have no means to become energy efficient because you don't own your capital. And so the landlord doesn't care, because they just shove the problem onto the tenant. And the tenant can't do anything about the place. So that, that disconnect is a huge issue. Yeah. But looking at it, I, I do need to take issue a little bit with, you know, other people don't need to figure it out. It's ridiculously simple. I mean, you need to have buildings with triple pane windows. That's and, that's it. But what I was talking about, though, was Janice uh, suggesting that, that it could be monetized and reinvested, some kind of financial package that 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 takes advantage of assets that are that are being created by by being more efficient and, and you know I, I realize that I, I agree with you that it's not that complicated to, cr to finance and create energy efficient buildings but I think you were talking about some sort of one off from that taking that process and reinvesting the savings or, or the asset that's being created in, in that first building into other buildings. Okay, we'll take one more. Okay. Take one more quick question, maybe from up the front. Sorry, you'd be right hand down. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Um, my name is Julian Wen, and I'm with um, Strata Sustainability Consulting. Um, how do you think Canada can be a leader in the sustainable finance space, and what global trends do you see where uh, Canada can go? Good. I'm bringing it back to to. What I know better. <laughs> um, um, well, the first thing, how can Canada be? We, clearly, we have not been a leader, and, and part of it is, I think, you know, the drag on the economy and and in the corporate boardrooms because everybody, you know, in Toronto and on Bay Street is heavily invested in in the resource economy, which is carbon intensive. Um, uh, so that's that's an issue. Um, but we're, we are now seeing um, movement. Um, the, the Canadian um, the, the Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada are offering courses on how to, how to inform the boards uh, of, of these issues and how to do the reporting. It has to, it has to come from, uh, at the provincial level, which is where the Securities Commissions are regulate it. We don't have climate policy friendly governments at the moment. Um, so the federal government is going to have to do what it can. It's going to have to, it's going to, have to, to push the envelope, I, I think, and, and make it clear that from a regulatory standpoint, banks need to, the, the UK is now, and I would love to see Canada adopt this, a very concrete thing. The UK is now requiring every bank and, finance and insurance company to stress test their business. Um, if you remember the the, um, the collapse of the, some of you are probably too young to remember, but the collapse of the real estate market in 2008, um, you know, the big issue coming back was we need to stress test the banks to make sure we're not bailing out Lehman Brothers or somebody like it or AIG, you know, the, the insurance company. Um, 
so it, it's literally a process of going in and look and looking at the bank's books and saying, okay, if the world actually, if we all got our acts together and passed regulations and got us down the path to a 1.5 degree or 2 degree world, what kind of impact would that have on the bank? And when 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 that starts, when when that starts being built into their their thinking at the board level, I think you're going to see um, more change and, and more certainly more awareness of it. And and as I say, it's not a be all and end all. I, I, I used to work with my good friend Barry McKenna, who always wrote columns and always warned that whatever he was proposing was not a panacea. So there are no panaceas, but it's an important tool. And I think Canada, I think Canada, I'm not sure Canada will ever be a leader in this because of our resource economy. I think Canada, there are a number of things that the federal government can do to to at least be in the game and to be with the leaders. The Bank of Canada is part of, as, as is the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, which regulates the banks and the insurance companies. They're part of a international network greening the financial system. So they're at the table. They know it's coming. They're part of the discussion. Do something. And I, I hope we'll see it in, in this budget. I'm not convinced. I, th I think just since we ran a little bit late, we're going to be sticking around downstairs. That'll be our last question. Just a final thought, Sean. If you could give one takeaway for the people at this event tonight, what would it be? One wrap-up thought. <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> I, I think it's. I think it is that. Um, it is that. You know, we're in a capitalist society, I mean, and a lot of people might not be crazy about that fact, um, but but it is true. And as long as we are, um, it, it's incredibly important to make sure that capital markets are working in a way that supports the transition. And capital markets won't do that without a big push from government. And so, you know, I, I, it's, it's really important that we all understand this, this climate finance and that it be part of the conversation here in Ottawa in particular, uh, if you have policy conversations, that it be part of that conversation so that government hears, that, um, hears it back because governments only respond when they, when they hear things, I think. Largely. Great. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks. Let's give Sean a huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. I had some, if you are interested, um, I pulled some references. So, Mark Carney's speech, 2015, Tragedy of the Horizons. Mark Carney's speech, Fall of 2019 on America's Pledge. Both really good. Um, places to, to look for a, a good discussion of this. Read the financial, the final report of the expert panel on sustainable finance. Very readable. You don't have to be a financial expert. There's a Carbon Tracker website. Mm -hmm. Carbon Tracker looks at, I mean, it is what it says it is, it tracks carbon, but from a financial point of view, very um, accessible uh, information in there. Uh, and finally, um, you can always keep in touch with me, and I am always happy to take questions and keep the conversation going. I, I like taking emails. If you seriously, if you have questions, if you want to know where to go for information, stock picks. <laughs> Ask my wife. <laughs> I'm the worst. Actually. I, I don't pay much attention to it. Every time I buy something, it, it, it dips. It's, it's today yeah, another no, one. I just <laughs> can't seem to take them. Even they're very good at that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Perfect. That's hey, Sean, the video will be available if you want to go back. If you want to go back and find all those things that Sean just said, our video will be up in the next couple of days. So you can go back and refer to those if you weren't able to take notes. Thanks again, Sean. All right, Lucas, thank you for the invitation. And we're all heading downstairs. We're going to have a reserved space in the bar. Get your tickets to next month's event. Get your CEP membership. Talk to you soon.